Yeah, it's me, Dolly Parton. Here's what's about to happen. I'm leaving the Porter Wagner Show. I'm getting brand new producers. I will be bridging country music and pop. I'm gonna be in movies. Are you in or are you out? Back me or back off. And they're all like, cool, we're in. Yeah, absolutely, we're in. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're Dolly Parton. Yeah, great, let's do it. Hey, America, I'm Brian Terry Henry. We about to talk about change gonna come. It's sang by Sam Cook. Get into the shit. So, our story starts in 1960, the era of for black people in this country. We've been dealing with Jim Crow and shit, and at the same time, we're still dominating the music scene. We've been giving you like the Supremes, we give you the Temptations, we give you like Otis Redding. And so one of the people that was dominating the music scene in the biggest way was Sam <laughs> Cook. So Sam was known as a soul singer, but now he had crossed over to pop music. So at this point, Sam Cook is like going on tour and like he's riding on his bus. So he has this dude named J.W. Alexander. So J.W. Alexander is like, yo, I don't need you to like lose your mind right now, but you know what we're going through right now with the civil rights shit. There's a white dude out there that, that put out this song that's like kind of like changing the world, bro. So J Dubs lays this track down, and it's Bobby Dylan singing, blowing in the wind. And Sam is listening to this shit like, wait, stop, wait, stop, hold up, stop. This song is dope, first of all, but this white dude is singing about everything that me as a black man is feeling going through this bullshit. I have to believe I can do better than that. So he like picks up a ukulele because he had a ukulele on the bus for some reason. Sam Cooke? Sam Cooke has a ukulele. Jack Sam? Johnson? Who the f is that? I knew you wouldn't get that. Do you know anything about Jean A? Jean Bonnet? Yeah, I think the brother. R&B girl. <laughs> Change is gonna come. <laughs> so the instrument is ukulele is like, ah oh, man, what's this song gonna be? What's this song gonna be? Ah, uh, do something that's gonna talk about real shit. What black struggle is like. Uh, he just wasn't, it just wasn't, he couldn't figure it out. So he has to stop in Shreveport, Louisiana. So like he's driving to Louisiana in the 60s, man. He's like seeing like colored only, white only. So go to this motel, because you know black people can go to hotels, you go to motels. Motel, hotel. Holiday Inn! <laughs> you were blacker than I thought, Derek. Like you actually have been, got my eye on you. <laughs> uh, anyway, so he's checking in, whatever. And he's got his like entourage. And he's like, ding, ding, ding. Sam Cooke is here. So of course, this white person's back there eating like white potato salad and shit. And so he's like, yeah. Sam was like, mm, checking in, Sam Cook. I'm like, mm, let me check, let me check, let me check through the files. Nothing here. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm Sam Cook. You're literally like my song is on the radio right there. The, the, the person behind the counter is like, I don't care. He's like a color boy to me. So Sam is like, no, this didn't. So he's like, all his friends are trying to get them together. And his wife rolls up. Sam's amazing wife, Barbara. She's like, bae, stop, bae. They don't care that you Sam Cook. Look at that bland ass potato salad he's eating. <laughs> you black, we in Louisiana. They'll kill your ass. Calm down, breathe, bae, bae, breathe. Bae. He's like, bae, you right. And she's like, bae, I know. But at this point, the intended already called the cops. So the cops are already there. And they're like, hey, we hear that there's Negroes in here causing trouble. And the attendant is like them right there, like with the spoon, with the potato salad. And like, them, <laughs> them right there, they're causing trouble. Man, Who look with you that had potato salad? You don't understand. Plain ass potato salad is a, is a cause for a riot in my life. If that shit isn't yellow, <laughs> if there's not eggs in that bitch, if there ain't no relish, if there ain't no like, I, get out of my house. <laughs> Anyway, so of course, they put all these dudes in jail. And so Sam was like sitting there and he's like, damn, I still ain't finished this song though. Damn, even though I'm Sam Cooke, that don't mean shit. They'll still throw me in jail and they embarrass me in front of Babs? Something's gotta change, man, something's gotta change. Boom! He's like, shit, a change gonna come. A change gonna come. So he starts writing a song in jail. Like he was like, damn, man, I was born in a tent. I wasn't even in a house, like I was by a river, you know what I'm saying? And that's how it started. See, I was born by the river in Little Town. Oh, oh my God! Like this is the one. This, this is the shit. Change gonna come. So he gets out of jail, finishes his song, and then on February seventh, nineteen sixty-four, he goes on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson to debut this masterful piece called "The Change Gonna Come." These white people out there going crazy. Sam was like, yes, you, a change is gonna come. You, a change is gonna come. You know a change is gonna come, Sam Cook. But then, like, two days later, 
The Beatles performed their new singles on Ed Sullivan literature. And so, like, the Beatles kind of stole the thunder from Sam, and Sam was like, Again it happened. Another white band stole my shine. So, you know, he decides to, like, go out. So he meets this chick named Elisa Boyer. She had a reputation. She was like, I can get any man I want, because, you know, look at this. I'm fine, and what I do is Elisa Boyer. So here we are, yet another motel. And they do what they do. They rolling in sack. He's like, oh, she's like, oh my god, the change's gonna come. He's like, yeah, change's gonna come. And change's gonna come. And it's like, oh, fine. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, oh Sam, forgive me. <laughs> like he got, huh, he's. What was that? I don't know. Hopes, dreams. <laughs> and then, like, <laughs> so either way, Sam Cook is in the bathroom, like you know, just showering off. And so at least Boyer snatches all his stuff and runs out. And like Sam opens the bathroom door, like naked, just standing there. And he's like, no, she didn't. No, did she really? So Sam throws on trench coat. He goes to the lobby. And like he's running around, and like the hotel manager like sees this dude in the trench coat. And he's like, hey, did you see this this chick come in with my stuff? I'm sitting here in the trench coat, my balls are out, and she's like, ah, penis. Oh my god. He's like, no, 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 I'm Sam Cook. Like, chill out, I'm Sam Cook. And then she just like shoots him. Like, just like shoots him. And his last words, his last words were, lady, you shot me. And that's it. It's out. And, and he, the, the sad part about the whole thing is, is that he couldn't even see the success of what change is gonna come and happen. Cause like after he died, change is gonna come like skyrocket. It became like it became the song of the civil rights movement. Like that song would play. It gave black people hope, and it is still relevant. God damn it! It just really lets you know the pain that like we have gone through. Like damn, being black in this country is so hard. It's just so stupid. Change needs to come. You know what change comes, Derek? I'm getting reparations right now because I got your white ass to buy me liquor. Change's already started, man. Like, so cheers to us. Amen. Change's gonna come. Cheers. Thank you, Sam. I love you. I love Derek. you, Brian. I really love you. I love you for sentimental reasons. Now I'm tingling. That was a Sam Cook song. Oh, <laughs> was it? <laughs> I knew that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, today we're gonna to talk about Dolly Parton and Porter Wagner. Porter Wagner had his own television show in Nashville. On his show he sang songs and he also had what they called a girl singer named Norma Jean. But Norma Jean left the show. Enter Dolly Parton. And Dolly Parton just thinks, oh sh he heard the songs that I sent in for Norma Jean and wants me to write more songs. And Porter Wagner sits her down and is like, hey, I want you to be on my show and you'll be the girl singer, because you're a girl. Over the course of the next six years, just like, kill it. 13 duet albums, 18 hits, and everyone loves them. And she wants to have a solo career, but every time she writes a song, he's like, you gotta do it this way, I'm the boss, it's my show, you will do it how I say, I'm Porter Wagner, it's the Porter Wagner show, you're my girl singer. Okay, I guess I'll follow along, because I have to, because you're the boss. But her solo, like none of her songs are doing that well in her solo career. And one night she signs an autograph with this little, auburn-haired girl. She says, hey, darling, what's your name? And the girl says, Jolene. And she says, Jolene, 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 Jolene. That is the name of a country and western song. And that is her first huge hit. Everyone is like, we like that song, Dolly Parton. <laughs> so. They clapped. But they bought the record. And now she's got to tell Porter Wagner she's got to go and do her own thing. And she doesn't know how to tell him. So she decides, I got to write a song. Because that's how, when you're Dolly Parton, that's how you express yourself. She sits him down and she sings to him, I will always love you. I will always love you. Fact! It's probably the most beautiful song that's ever been written. And if you, if you listen to that song, the chorus of that song, she makes this promise to Porter Wagner, I will always love you. And he says, 
That is the most beautiful thing I've ever heard in my life. That's the best song you've ever written. Of course you can go. This is so fun. This is the most fun I've ever had in my life. I'm going to literally Instagram this shit right now. Where's my phone? She goes to New York City. And she walked straight into the RCA offices. Yeah, it's me, Dolly Parton. Here's what's about to happen. I'm leaving the Porter Wagner show. I'm getting brand new producers. I will be bridging country music and pop. I'm going to be in movies. Are you in or are you out? Back me or back off. And they're all like, cool, we're in. Yeah, absolutely, we're in. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're Dolly Parton. Yeah, great, let's do it. And she does exactly what she said she would do to those RCA executives. She starts recording pop music. And Porter Wagner, Porter Wagner, only thought about himself. And Porter Wagner sues Dolly Parton. Basically says, I want 15% of what you did, I want 15% of what you're doing, and I want 15% of what you're gonna do. And Dolly Parton is like, Porter Wagner, just chill, chill out, man. So she's like, let's settle out of court. The Wagner's like, cool, I'll take a million dollars. I like a million dollars. What does she do next? Um, only makes her first movie. Dolly Parton is making 95. She's making Best Little Horus in Texas. She's crushing it. Porter Wagner during this time, he's off blowing money. He's giving jewelry out to the women like crazy. He buys a fing Orange Grove. He owes the IRS $500,000. But Dolly Parton made a promise to Porter Wagner that she would always love him. And she did and buys his entire music catalog from him for millions of dollars. She helped him out when he was destitute. Finally, when he gets back on his feet, Porter Wagner tries to buy his music catalog back from Dolly. And she sends him a fax, and the fax just says, you can have it all back for free. Love you, Dolly. Oh boy, I am real drunk. In 2007, Dolly Parton has a premonition <sighs> that she needs to go to Porter Wagner. Porter Wagner was dying. She went to his deathbed. She sang to him. But no, I'll think of you each step of the way. She lived up to that promise until his, and I'm sure to her, dying day. I really wanted to sing. Did I ever sing? Oh, boy, did you sing. Did I really? Boy, did you sing. I did? Hello, I'm Daryl Johnson, and today we're going to talk about Louis Armstrong and the people that made Louis the Louis Armstrong we know today. Grew up in the roughest and poorest part of New Orleans. He'd be like, I'm gonna sing for some money. When people would throw pennies at him, he would pick up the pennies and throw them in his mouth so that the big kids wouldn't take them from him. And that's how he got his first nickname, Satchmo. You take all the coins and put them in your mouth like a satchel. Satch mouth. His mom works as an off and on again prostitute in the brothels where all the jazz music was playing. So Louis would be like, hey girl, can I listen real quick to the band that's playing on the other side of this wall? And so he would listen to the Kid Ori Band and King Joe Oliver. The baddest cornetist in town. Couldn't nobody touch King Oliver. And little Louie was listening through those walls and was like, that's what I want to do. I want to play that music. Whew. Ah! It's burning the inside of my body! OK. So one day, a Jewish coal merchant, Bernhard Karnowski, saw little Louie at the brothels and said, hey, little kid, I can give you a job if you work for me delivering coal to the prostitutes. Come into our family, and we're going to feed you and treat you like one of our own. Mrs. Karnowski would sing little Jewish lullabies to Louie as a young boy, and they'd be like, no, wait. No, that's the prayer. The lullaby would probably be like, we're Jewish and we love it. 
That's like nice, right? That's perfect. <laughs> so at seven years old, he's working for the Karnaskis. On the truck, he used to play a horn, like, bah, 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 we're coming. And they were driving past this pawn shop. And in the window of this pawn shop was this old beat up cornet. And he was like, I want that. So Louis asked Karnaski, do you think you can advance me the $5 to buy that cornet? He said, of course I can loan you the $5. And it was a piece of junk, but it was his piece of junk. And he used to polish it. He was like, because he wasn't really that good yet. But he would say, I'm going to be the best cornetist in all Louisiana. And wore a star of David for the rest of his life to commemorate how much the Karnofsky family meant to him. That was way before all these celebrities today made it popular to just go grab a little black kid off the street. <laughs> so he's out one night, and he decides to shoot a gun into the air to celebrate New Year's. And the police was like, uh-uh, can't be a little black kid in New Orleans shooting a gun in the air. We're going to arrest you. He got taken to the New Orleans home for colored waifs. It sounds racist. Yes, I'm sure it was pretty racist. This is, we're like talking 1913. And that's when he meets Pete Davis, the musical instructor, musical instructor. Pete Davis taught him how to read music and how to play technically. He's like, you're going to be the best, the best damn horn player in New Orleans. And so a couple years later, when he gets out, he's playing in all these like CD bars. Everybody in New Orleans was like, hey, that's little Louis Armstrong. He used to make the horn talk. Is that what they said? It's what it sounded like. <laughs> Get you a prostitute, get you some whiskey, and have a good time. <laughs> and one day, his idol, King Joe Oliver, heard him play. And he was like, Man, this kid's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's another one. I told you, Sazerac could do oh, something right. special. All right, it was King Oliver who taught him how to perform. So they used to march all around town in parades, marching bands, and that's how Louis got his soul. Papa Joe would be like, if you heard the crowd getting into his music, give him a little bit more, right? So if you was like, just throw more notes. And little Louis was like, sure. I'm drunk, I'll do whatever you want. I'm so drunk. What do you want now? What was I talking about? <laughs> We're talking about Louis Armstrong. So, to be honest, he was playing better than Papa Joe. Louis became the number one cornetist in New Orleans. And everybody was like, man, this Louis Armstrong is good. And that's when he blew up. Cheers. Louis to Armstrong. Louis. To Louis. Without that love that he was given, he might. It might not be the Louis Armstrong we know have today. Always remember where you got that that inspiration from. Thank you. Thank you. Louis. Louis Armstrong was the greatest. Oh, to do it slow. You want me to crack your back? Yeah. Okay. But do it slow. <laughs> you you want to crack? You're drunk. I'm drunk. Hello. Today we're talking about Chris Christopherson. Chris Christopherson got incredible grades, and he was a Rhodes Scholar. And then he uh, was trained as an Army Ranger to fly helicopters. His platoon commander knew someone in Nashville that worked for Johnny Cash. We can get you in free to a show at the Grand Ole Opry. Yeah, I love it. Let's do it. So Chris takes a one-week leave and watches Johnny Cash. He felt a power and an energy, because that's what Johnny Cash did. Chris felt transfixed. My God, this is my hero. And Chris said in that moment that he was thunderstruck. And then Johnny Cash walked off, and Johnny Cash walked over and shook his hand. Boom. Holy shit. This is my hero, and he just came up to me and connected with me. So Chris says, you know what, I'm gonna quit this. And he quits the army, and he moves to Nashville, Tennessee, with the idea of becoming a great singer-songwriter. Finally, a, a job opens up of being a janitor at uh, Columbia Records. And then his mother writes him a letter. Your hero, Johnny Cash, is a drug addict. And of course he sings at San Quentin Folsom right now because a jailbird sings to jailbirds. 
So we have now officially disowned you. We hope somehow you come to your senses because you're not a songwriter. Sorry, Chris, you're done. And he felt like a giant failure. He's a f***ing janitor. And then one day, Johnny Cash comes in. He's like, who in the world is in there right now changing the ashtrays with those brown, with the uh, incredible blue eyes? Well, that's Chris. Who is he? His mom just disowned him <laughs> because you're his hero. And uh, Chris was in there changing the ashtrays. And Johnny Cash comes in and says, uh, well, it's always nice to get a letter from home, ain't it? And Chris can't believe it. He's like, yeah. But they bonded over it because he was passionate and he had his dream. I'm gonna quit all this and I wanna pursue an artist's life. So he quit. Chris is starving. He has no money. He's now writing these songs. And then Chris, he's so frustrated and he has one song. It's about that feeling to be on a Sunday when the bars don't open. And it's called Sunday morning coming down. It's that feeling, loneliness, and nobody believing in you but you. And wishing the Lord that I was stoned. If there ain't nothing on a Sunday that makes a body feel alone. A Sunday Morning Coming Down was the song Chris knew was something special. How can I get my song with Johnny Cash and make an impact? So, according to Johnny, Chris lay in that uh, helicopter in his lawn to give him this song. Some fool was landing in our yard with a helicopter right out of the sky. He really listened to the song, and the song went to the next level for Johnny because he understood it. He understood the isolation and the loneliness and wishing the Lord that he was stoned. <laughs> Excuse me. You're fine. <clears throat> So at that time, Johnny Cash was recording his own variety show for ABC. So Johnny said uh, to Chris, hey, we're gonna do Sunday morning coming down right now. And then went through a run through of the song. On a Sunday morning sidewalk, wishing Lord that I was stone. Well, he did it one time and the ABC censors came up and said, uh, Johnny, uh, great song. But we actually can't uh, in any way put on the lyrics, wishing Lord that I was stoned, because it's clearly an allusion to marijuana, and uh, it's in the country tradition, you can do something about alcohol, but marijuana is a no-go. You have to change that. You wishing Lord I was home? I wrote it, wishing Lord that I was stoned, because I wished I was stoned. So when it comes time to record the song in that show, they put Chris way up in the rafters, because he was, he was on the fringes, man. So the song starts, and he's like, on a Sunday morning sidewalk. And then his gaze goes right up to Chris in the very back row. He's like, wishing Lord that I was stoned. Because there's something in the sidewalk that makes a body feel alone. And Chris said he felt his heart warm. God bless, you know, my son is on TV. And it meant the world to Chris because his hero did right by him. Once Johnny Cash says it's cool, well, everybody wants to record Christopherson's song. Waylon Jennings, Joni Mitchell, James Taylor, Janis Joplin. Chris Christopherson. Chris Christopherson became the biggest star in the world. Truly, in 1976, and it's been forgotten, he was the biggest star in the world at the time. Chris was huge. 